What's going on, guys? And welcome back to another spoiler kit recap here at Big Gold Belt Media. Today, we're going to talk about episode five of The Sympathizer on HBO called All for One. Uh, this episode actually premieres on May 12th. So, happy Mother's Day to everybody out there on May 12th. Um, and it will be premiering at 9 p.m. on HBO and streaming on HBO. Um, all for one, definitely a great name for this episode, I think, but it was, it was driven by a lot going on right now. Of course, I mean, we had that epic cliffhanger in episode four, where we got to see Mon, I mean, not Mon, I'm sorry, uh, the captain nearly losing the whole back of his body, right? I mean, it was, yep. it was wild, right? Um, but this episode kind of picks up right then and there, um, with the action, which I, I honestly, I really love about these episodes so far, because there's no time gaps in between the two. Um, right. there is a little time gap in this episode, but it really picks right back up where we left off. Um, as everybody knows in episode four, if you haven't seen it already, um, the captain is revisiting his mother's grave, which is kind of like more of like a prop in this film that they're shooting called the Hamlet, um, that right. he was, he was used as like a dialogue, right? And, um, He's taking it way too personal, so he goes back to this grave, and he's really, like, you know, talking to his mom and trying to take the picture of his mom off of the grave, not knowing that there are explosives at any moment getting ready to detonate all over mm -hmm. him. He sees, like, the F-150s flying in the sky, takes off, starts running, and we get a crazy Mission Impossible jumping out of the window in the nick of the time <laughs> scene where, where the captain barely makes it. And it picks right back up in episode five, just right then and there. Um, when you saw this name, man, did you think, you know what? How bad is it going to be for him right now? What, what did you think was going to happen? Right back in this episode? Well, let me let me tell y'all this. First off, I did not expect the episode was going to go the way it wound up going because we went on a fantastical voyage during this episode yeah, to places yeah. I didn't think we'd go to. Now, if you've watched the reviews here, you know I, I, I like random. I like random stuff. But there are some random moments, especially in this episode, where I'm like, this isn't where we started off at back in episode one. We have now taken a left turn at Albuquerque, and I don't know what to think anymore, which goes back to what I was saying earlier this season about the later episodes that the captain's recollection and storytelling starts to unravel the more mm -hmm. the more episodes we get in right. but to, but to answer your question did i expect the mission impossible tom cruisean escape no but what happened next in the hospital was hilarious because you and i were comparing uh negotiation totals <laughs> in 1974 versus right. let's say right. today's money so I'm like, all right, Captain survived. Right. That's great. I, I and I'll yeah. say this. I really thought the captain was making that airplane explosion stuff up. I really thought I'm like, that didn't happen. That must be a figment of his imagination. Right. You know? So to see him in the hospital with like all those burns, you know, what he said six months he was gone, or like he was in the hospital for a couple of weeks. So uh well, he was so so for, filming for, for six filming, months. I think it was six months, and I think he was in three. He was in like three, four weeks in the hospital, though. Yeah, exactly. So he went from you fired to now in a hospital bed, you know, basically suffering and having his his people come visit. The studio lawyer shows up, which was random because you and I even said, "Who the fuck are these people rolling up on his hospital bed?" But it was a very interesting start to the episode but what it also helped to do it helped to and and the show's good at this it ties up those loose ends like you were saying it ties up the loose ends from the last episode at the cliffhanger let's say to the first 15 10 15 minutes of the of the next episode so this continued in that realm where they nipped that in the bud the explosion bargaining with i guess the studio lawyer on compensation and then we we go to the next version of the storyline and, and i like the fact that this series has been able to do that seamlessly it's not like you said it's not like oh a fast forward jump it's not like a a, a time skip it's more of a okay this happened last episode let's put a bow on this this happened now this happened last episode let's put a bow on this so i like that format 
uh, more so than us trying to figure out what the hell's happening at the beginning. So good, good on them. Yeah. 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 I think they do such a great job. I mean, honestly, like you just said, I mean, because I hate having to wonder what happened in between the time that we haven't been watching this show, you know, and they just tie it in seamlessly, which I think is such a great job. Like you said as well. Um, but yeah, we pick right back up and then the captain is, he's been rushed to the hospital and he's slowly recovering at this time. Of course, his man, uh, Bond, right? Bond, I'm on. Bond is right there, you know, by his side because they are blood brothers at the end of the day. Literally. Um, no matter what, both, yeah, literally blood brothers. And we get to see a little bit of that in this episode because um, through this time in his hospital stay, it seems like the mind state of the captain is slowly unraveling, as you put it, because he's starting to kind of recollect other things um right. that happened in his past and also that are happening right now that we didn't really get to see um you know to just kind of fill in some gap pieces um and i think it's crazy because in the explosion part when he was getting blown up right i mean of course the story is being narrated the whole entire time by the captain to the uh commander communist right or the communist commander i can't remember which way his name goes but something like that and um he says in one part oh okay, this is where my memory starts to get fuzzy, right? Mm -hmm. And it's crazy because we've been fuzzy memoried for like five episodes already. Correct. So I'm like, now it's getting fuzzy? So I'm like, what? is this the real? What, what story is real and what story is fake? So it just seems like, you know, we're in like an entanglement of storytelling. And right now he's just slowly trying to keep unraveling a new story to stay alive. Yeah. Um, But yeah, like you said, we get to see some negotiation because the studio realizes that they made a mistake with this ex mm -hmm. explosion and the captain should not have been in the proximity before they started executing these explosives. So they know, you know, we got to pay this guy or we're screwed. You know, we're not going to be able to recover from this. And the captain decides, I honestly, I thought he was going to take the money. Did you think he was just going to take the smaller check or do you think no. he was going to try to negotiate? No, more with it? I, I think I knew he was going to negotiate because he can't stand the director. Like now he hates him even more. So he's like, all right, now I'll put the screws to you. Now I damn near lost my life. You fired me pretty much ruined his relationship in the moment with the mm -hmm. general's daughter. So like, you know, the studio is over right. five in dealing with the captain. So I knew he was going to put the screws to him, but the part I loved in the negotiation <laughs> when he was talking about his memory is <laughs> he's like, I'm sorry, say that again. I seem to be losing my hearing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was hearing uh, but I guess they said like his memory wasn't tangible, I guess they'd call it. Right. I mean, but I, in today's sense, that is a huge tangible thing to lose. But I guess in the 1970s, they didn't really see it medically in that yeah, way. I mean, deal. of course, this is this mm -hmm. is a story, you know, a larger story. But still, it's like, you know, that's probably how they saw it medically at that time, um, which I thought was crazy. Um but yeah, so I mean, I think also the crazy part about that that scene is that they were doing negotiation with, um, you know, I think his first number that he threw out there was thirty thousand, right? He was like thirty thousand dollars. That's what I need because they're trying to get my check for three k, right? Thousand. I'm mm -hmm. like, dude. That, 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 that. So he tried to go ahead and push the envelope and say, I need at least thirty k, right? Cash. And they go back and forth, and the guy was like, yeah, he was like cash too, right? And an apology from the director. And he eventually worked it down to 15. But it's crazy when the lawyer opened up the suitcase, he had 20, right? Mm -hmm. He had 20K in his suitcase, the four envelopes. And he shuffled the four envelopes and he put one down. That means he was willing to at least probably pay 20. But oh, yeah. Haggle. I guess he was able to save 5K. I don't know. I guess I was just in an emergency, right? Yeah. That's what I would expect for it. So I, I, it was it was crazy though. Um, but yeah, I mean, and then we get to see like that not many people have been visiting the captain since he's been in the hospital during that time, mm -hmm. which he was kind of disappointed about because he thought you know his girlfriend would have came to see him, Sophia or his supposedly girlfriend, his girlfriend, right? Um, supposedly his girlfriend. And she sends him a gift, like a get well gift, and it's a cactus. It's like. Mm, if that don't say, that don't say dry spell to me. Like I don't know what. <laughs> Literally, what that, that means like, it's over. Doesn't mean no cat. I was like, yeah, it's over. It's dried up. We're done. The well is dry. Um, and then the other one was like flowers from Ned Grossman, the guy, Congressman, which I thought was 
kind of awkward because I was like, why is he sitting in something? You know, like they really didn't even know that each other that well. Um, but yeah, so we, we get to see the captain actually return back. Um, or before that, actually, he gets Claude actually comes in, right? And he talks to him and they kind of have a conversation where he's trying to push the envelope about getting this apology from the director. And Claude is very like stacked and about like, don't. Don't, don't try to get it because yeah. he's not going to, you know, apologize to you in the first place. But the captain, you know, tries to stick to his guns and eventually he is released from the hospital. But the captain doesn't seem like he wants to leave and go back home. He's just kind of having these these memory episodes or these time lapses where his head is just not on straight. If you want to walk us through, tell, tell us exactly what you thought when you were seeing the captain actually return back home. Though. This reminded me of something we said earlier in a previous episode about how. I thought the captain being back in America, he was going to lose his patriotism for his home, right? Like, cause he fell in love with, with America as a college student and he got into the life. Like he started being on the proximity of the life and, you know, be cultured and all this other stuff. And it, you know, being afraid of being a sellout. So right. having him back in his normal Cali life where he tries to go back to everything like it's a Tuesday, uh, six months is a long time in real time. You know what I mean? We don't think it's a long time, but it really is. Yeah, yeah. He, he goes back yeah. home. He tries to make you know peace, make peace with the general, general's family, Dumpling's mm -hmm. widow, Dumpling's mom. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, Sophia, and and his world has changed in that time that he's gone not only to Hollywood, but those few weeks that he was in the hospital. So yeah. I don't want to say his life did a 180, but it was a major shift where, again, at the beginning where I said it seems as if he's starting to unravel even more now. It's becoming more and more evident mm -hmm. that what he thought was yeah. is longer. And, and the, the actor mm -hmm. is, portraying, is portraying this as subtle shock and surprise that things can change this quickly for again comfortability's sake like he got a groove you know he's got the the general he's got the captain he's got he's the captain he's got his gig he's got a girlfriend like all right cool what do you mean my life's gonna do about a 180 right about now and that that yeah. i guess maybe what the first 20 minutes after he's out of the hospital where we see him trying to make amends with people or catch up with people uh just goes to show his place in the society that he thought he was like this with is no longer mm -hmm. in that kind of standing. So what does he do? He tries to go yeah. back to the things that bring him closure or closer to family, which is the general's daughter. Eventually, as we see, as the episode continues to go yeah. along, he tries to rekindle that connection to the general for the mission, right? We see him riding right. Mon, you know, again, he's got that pep in his step again, but something's off. And as we watch the episode, we see yeah. what's off. It's him. But that's why I wrote in our group chat. I said, oh, this might be PTSD. Because there's always something coming up for him after the fact that makes me think he's going through PTSD right now. We think he's seeing Mon at certain points. He thinks he's going to go see yeah. Sophia. And it turns yeah. out he's with What's-His-Face. And I was pissed off when I saw that shit. Um, you know? talking about oh i don't want to be a third wheel at the general daughter's date and he winds up being the third wheel and is now ex girl right. soon to be ex-girlfriend's house so right. bro like the captain and we see it at the camp right present day his mental capacity is unraveling more yeah. and more every episode and i think for me this was the breaking point episode where what he thought like I said, is no longer it. So yeah. now he has to pivot, and here's the pivot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, this episode was kind of like an awakening point, I guess you could say, for the captain, because he was just, I think he thought while being in this camp that he could tell this story and then immediately, mm -hmm. you know, be released. And now he's seeing that the more story he tells, the deeper wedge he's digging himself into you know yeah um because they're they're i mean the 
communist comrade is highly intrigued by his story. But now he's starting to check him on a lot more facts. And now it's 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 obviously making him seem like more of a spy at this point. Um there's a part of the episode where, you know, like like you said, he returns back to um the general and the general has not only been successful in the liquor business, but now he has a faux shop, right? Yeah. Probably one of the first ones in that way. No, I mean, I'm not if that's historically recollected, but that seems like uh, something brand new, you know, new, new, uh, new, new, new types of food in the area. So that that's crazy. I'm pretty sure business is booming out there, especially for a lot of people, uh, the Vietnamese that were displaced from their home and stuff. So comes to find out that there is a new war effort that the general mm -hmm. is putting together so that he can get soldiers together and go back home to Saigon and take back over. Um, honestly, I think the captain is like, you know what, why are we doing this? Yeah. Like, I thought slowly I was diffusing the problem and now we would just eventually just assimilate into the American culture and kind of, you know, just stay stagnant like that. But now he sees that the drive of the captain, the more funds that he's acquiring from his people for donations, the higher his, I guess, his drive is mm -hmm. to, you know, take back over the city that he wants called home. So I think that is it's such a dangerous plot twist because now, you know, the captain is put in another scenario where he has to fake like he really wants to go back home and, you know, help out these efforts. I mean, he does want to return back home, don't get me wrong, but it's not for what's going on for the general right. at all. Um, but then there's this weird conversation between Sonny and um the captain right and this is before of course we get to the little uh romper room right <laughs> that was a great term <laughs> like she called it uh -huh. and <laughs> yeah i was like i was like oh go ahead um so he's having a conversation with sunny and sunny is always trying to dig and push and if a lot of people out there don't know who sunny is he is the i guess you say the the series of the captain in this yeah he's show, he's the yin to his theory. yang pretty much right that's that's how we can Much view him like op opposing forces yeah exactly exactly and of course at the same time the captain has to pretend like he's not a communist just like sunny because that's not the party or the side that he's on right i mean he's already pushed and you know pushed the envelope and actually called sunny a communist to his face but he still has to act like he's not on the same team to kind of keep his own uh, low profile so they're having the conversation and sunny at the same time is like you know i'm not your enemy you know, the war is over. Why is the general doing this? I know something's going on. We're, something's being planned. And it's a weird quote that the captain says. He says, wars don't die. They just hold their breath. That was, mm. I was like, mm. I was like, okay. I mean, that, I guess, right? I mean, I, I, I it, this one seems like it's done though for me. So I'm not sure why, why they're still trying to push, you know, to reclaim this, this area, I feel like they got it good. They're like in San Fran. They got a liquor store, a faux shop. You know what? A liquor store and a faux shop in the 1970s compared to today's money is like. We were we were just looking at the money being transferred in this episode, and we were like, "Hey, we we clean up, man." You know, yeah, half half um, a milli. Come on, man. Today's in today's times, half a million for stuff. Like, come on, man. You get some nice little real estate in Oakland for three thousand dollars. That thing worth. Like 1.2 right now, easy, mm -hmm. easy. It can be ran down in 1.2 for all we know. Um, but after he leaves his faux shop and he says goodbye to Sonny in kind of a weird, hateful, I don't hate you, but I don't like you type way. I don't like he you pops either. up at <laughs> Crip, right? Yeah. He's like, yeah, hey, what's up? You know, I don't like you, but I don't hate you, but hate your face. So he pops up at Sophia's crib after not seeing her for over six months. After her sending him that weird cactus while he was in the hospital bed. And the first thing she said, this is what gave me a red flag. I don't know if it gave me one. Is when he knocked on the door and she opened it. And he was like, she said, why didn't you call first? I was like, uh-oh. I said, oh, no. I said, oh, God. I said, she oh, got God, somebody's in there. Somebody's mm -hmm. in there. Come to find out. Here comes Sonny. Buttoning up his shirt with no socks on. With I'm no like, socks uh -oh. on. Yeah. And they, they they made a the camera made a point to zoom into his feet for some reason. And I was like, ah, he got his toes out, bro. You know he in there. 
having a great time. Like, <laughs> did you think you were going to see this twin with Sonny and Sophia at any point yes. of his watching this show through these episodes? Yes, because when we go back to the party where so where Sophia is, is the captain's yeah. date, she remarks that Sonny is so charming and, and funny and all that stuff. And we even said, <laughs> yeah. Man, we man, we knew, we knew right there. But we thought Sonny would be the one to make them move. But it turns out Sophie right. is the uh, Sophie is the right, aggressor. Right. But as we've watched this season, we shouldn't be surprised because mm -hmm. that's her, right? She's the older, free love woman. Where yeah. she's just like, well, the guy was fucking's in the hospital. Next, so right over here. So. Yeah. And this is what upsets me about the captain in this moment. Like, I get it from an emotional standpoint. That is your girlfriend. But she told him from jump, bro, mm -hmm. he just fuck it. That's it. Right. So right. Right. there wasn't anything exactly. more than that. But he got attached, which mm -hmm. is a, a bigger dichotomy for the oh, captain yeah. in general. Because every time the captain gets attached to something, lets his guard down, screws him over yeah so i didn't i didn't i'm not surprised this happened it didn't alleviate any of the yelling i was doing back here where i was when i was watching it i was like that yes, rat yes, bastard yes, <laughs> i said how do you beat your enemy you take his girl <laughs> yeah you know, yeah that's the best way to do it that was that was wild and i thought it was crazy because in the moment when it happened the captain decided, you know what, since I'm here, we're going to open up these glasses and we're going to drink together. And I was like, oh, this is weird. I would have just got out of there and stormed out probably. But he decided to stay and decided to have kind of like a, um, it, it, was, it was a spicy conversation that he wanted to have with all of them in yes. this scenario. But it was very spiteful, right? And there wasn't really like any facts or anything he wanted to throw at them. He just wanted to do it out of spite to kind of just like crap on them and in the moment to say they're bad people. And it was an instance where they were talking about, like, you know, how they found family history and they were doing all the people will see it in the episode. There's a lot of unimportant parts that were in there. But the captain decides immediately to take a jab at Sonny for not going back to his country yep. and fighting for what he writes about in the paper. Right. And this 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 hard jab into Sonny's heart is immediately diffused by, by Sonny's kindness to say, you know what? You are a better person than me. You are more Vietnamese than me. I am so sorry for saying these things about you. And in the moment, the captain probably was like, man, I'm an ass. Like, I'm such an asshole. <laughs> you know? Like, he's probably like, well, I'm I, the bad guy. Like, realizing I, he's the bad guy. <laughs> I'm the bad guy. Oh my God, you guys just cheated on me. And now I'm the bad guy. <laughs> like, this is awful. Let me just, I would just like, took my stuff and walked out. I'd be like, yeah, this there's no use me yelling at you guys at all. This is just awkward. Um, but luckily, there's always one in the chamber for the captain. He receives anonymous tickets in the mail. Mm -hmm. See a show called Asia featuring Kwai Lin, right? And we're like, who's Kwai Lin? Who is this, right? He goes right. and they dressed up. Of course, he's going to take Bond with him. I only saw one ticket in the envelope, but I guess they had two. Sure, whatever. He goes... Bond is like immediately trying to go get drinks. They they randomly sit to their seats. Quilin comes out, starts singing. Come to find out, the headliner of this show is Lana, the yep. general's daughter. General's daughter ain't no baby no more. She's out here doing some things. She's a grown like adult, a grown bro. She's in the streets right now. She's a grown mm -hmm. adult. Yep. She's doing her own thing. And the weird part is, in one scene, she was like, what did she say? She said, um, thank you so much for helping me do my first uh uh, like featured film, right? Yeah. And she said, this was the only first real film that I've ever been in. And I was like, what's that mean? Oh, we made so this only only real film. So what other films you've been in? I was like, uh, See, I didn't even think about that, that, but okay. Man. And I was like, ooh, 1970. Spicy film. Now. I said, right, mm -hmm. um, so, the spicy. I said, oh, romper room. All right, got you. So <laughs> watching it the whole time and she's over here, she's talking and she's on stage, she's singing, you know, she sounds really good. By yeah. By the way, like, it's like, wow, she really improved. You know, Bond said it like, wow, she really got better at singing. 
And she's singing on, on stage, and then she starts to dedicate her whole show to one person. It's <laughs> very kind, very brave. Captain is like, oh, man. oh my God, I got the tickets. You don't know, must be talking about me. And then she points to right in the direction of the captain, but right over his head <laughs> to Jamie. Jamie Johnson. Jamie Johnson. <laughs> AKA Ron Heisel, our favorite person from episode four. Um, <laughs> Magic Johnson is saying basically what I'm looking at. I'm like, oh my God, I'm like, this is crazy. Um, and of course, Jamie Johnson decides to join her on stage. Jamie Johnson knows Vietnamese all of a sudden, right? Uh -huh. That means we're thinking our hair, we're like, oh, he's been hanging out with quite a, Lynn, quite a bit. They've been having a quite lot a of. Romper room time, as they call it. Um, so, <laughs> and eventually the show's over. The captain looks hurt completely, right? He goes backstage and comes to find out that her and Jamie are just friends the whole time, you know? Right. Um, which I actually thought was a surprise. Did you think there was actually more to her and Jamie's relationship of just course. based on what we saw in episode four? Oh, of course. I would have thought. Back then, of course, I would have thought, hey, like, oh, they're they're getting canoodly and stuff like that. But again, remember who we're watching this through. Yeah. We're watching this through the captain's eyes and narration. So yeah. who's to say their relationship yeah. was romantic to begin with? Maybe he's just being a hater yeah. and was over here just making it seem as if, like, they were a thing, you know? So for her yeah. to shoot it down yeah. to say, she basically, she goes, me and Jamie no like that's 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 my boy that's jamie you know that's my that's my homie because it's obvious she likes the captain right it's yeah. obvious it's been obvious oh, yeah. from like oh. i guess episode three or two that she likes the captain uh you know general's yeah. daughter grow up together you know now we now we've reached a point in time where she's a grown-ass adult like we said and she makes a comment when he talks about she uh, where the captain breaks up with his ex and she goes oh so you need a new shoulder to cry on thinking yeah, like, oh like, okay like is that is that adaptation? like i've seen casino i've seen that movie whenever shoulder to cry on you know what that leads to they're there they're there they're there i mean so mm -hmm. i thought that's where we were going with this so uh, we didn't go there much to my chagrin what, what winds up, we, what, what you winds know up, why I didn't go there, right? Why? General would have killed him? Bond was just hating the whole time. He just came and blocked the whole time. That was my next thing. Bond just, yep. Bond rushes in the building like, hey, General says, get your ass home. Like, <laughs> just straight up blew up the spot. Yep. Because Because the General doesn't know that she's a songstress on the strip, right? He doesn't yeah. know that. So Bond's a snitch because remember, Bond's still working for the general. He's, he's come up with the general in, right. in, in, in multifacets since his family died. So he's still yeah. loyal to the general, even though, you know, Bond and the captain are supposed to be over here doing what Mon be doing allegedly but we'll talk about that right so the fact that now the general is aware now that his daughter has been schmoozing in hollywood longer than she needs to be it's like no no get your ass home so get your ass home and what makes me laugh is and i, I get it's the time right but all this talking about i ain't afraid of the general you're afraid of the general that's my dad i, I ain't afraid of him but the minute Bond rolls up yeah. in there and says, get your ass home, what? Yeah. She go home like a spoiled teenager. <laughs> and then goes back home all, all frumpy and whatnot. So I'm glad they didn't rush to the captain and her hooking up, even though I know they both want to. Right. I'm glad they didn't pull the trigger just yet. Especially because, you know, like you said, Bond just walking up. Bond just has a habit yeah. of showing up for when the stuff is about to go off and doing it the Bond way. Like, if it's not killing, dumpling, if it's not, you know, trying to assassinate someone or, or trying to, like, work in Hollywood, Bond's got to do something extra. So this is Bond doing something extra. And we did miss something. Um, I want to go back a little bit. 
about dumpling. We, we earlier oh, in the man. episode with the money that the captain gets from the payout, he goes. I call it guilt. He goes to the dumplings widow's house, drops the money on the table, and says, "Take this money," because she's a widow. And obviously, mom, mom of dumpling is there with the the tea biscuits and the tea, and you know we got the widow and it's just so the captain realizing he got an innocent man assassinated. So there's guilt there, right? Like, let's be real here. Even though dumpling might have been a little underhanded, the captain was super underhanded and got this man killed. And then we get that remember that call back to the episode where he's seeing things and he thinks he sees dumpling. So the captain yeah. on the couch yeah. thinks he sees Dumpling and Dumpling goes, now do you see what I had to deal with, with the wife being so emotional <laughs> and, and like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to give this money to the general because I believe in his mission. So we get that, that flash forward to the camp and the investigators even telling the captain, wait a minute, you gave the money that you got back to the woman whose husband you killed out of guilt and thusly now the money has to go back to the man you're trying to sabotage the fuck so i th i just thought that was a good callback for 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 dumpling and then the french biscuits the french cookies right where again there's a hint of why he doesn't like french things because of his dad so he, yeah. he eats it and then he spits yep. it out when he leaves the house. And we say all this because when the general and him are talking at the fuss shop, the general has this renewed sense of purpose, right? With the money now, it's like, what's he right. going to do with this money? Because right. he thinks he's can, he going to go back to Saigon and, and, and they're going to finally win the war all these years later. And we're just like, right. okay, we think that's it about the money. When we get to the end of the episode, now we know what happened with the money. But... It was for me, it was a good plot point to again bring back the fact that the captain killed an innocent man, innocent man. So he still has to pay his comeuppance for that. Him almost getting blown up, yeah. you know, in the film in the film session does nothing. It's the fact that he still has things to atone for. And fast forward now, all the way to the front where Bond is like, yo, go home. And now he's telling he's telling the captain, like, we got to get our shit together. Like, you're being beckoned. Yeah. We got stuff to do. Remember the mission. So we get this montage, right, of what is it, uh, his aunt, he's writing his Persian aunt, which is supposed to be writing Mon, but he's writing yeah. his Persian aunt in his, like, yeah. spy, ling spy language. And who randomly shows up? Cam, let them know who randomly shows up when he's trying to mail this letter to his Persian aunt. Who's there? So so once again, Claude randomly shows up, just 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 out of nowhere, walking this random. Hey, and I'm man. like, does he even own a dog? This is walk, uh -huh. right? So which I thought was crazy. And um, it's weird because when he got ready to mail the uh, the letter to Mont back in uh, Saigon. He actually was taking pictures of the general's plans and passed yeah. them along to Sonny because he was like, you know what, if I can this stuff exposed, maybe I can, might end up getting Sonny killed as well. Or maybe he do want Sonny killed, if you think about it, because I still think he not, wants Sonny killed. He's not a huge fan of Sonny in the first mm -hmm. place. So he's like, well, I mean, two birds, one stone, ruin the plans, get the stupid reporter that stole my girlfriend killed as well, who's my adversary. Works for me at the end of the day. Um, but I think this the part of this episode that we actually forgot also is that um, the whole reason it's called All for One, right? So it kind of gave us like a montage of uh, how Mon Bon and the captain all came together in this crazy, crazy way. Um, and kind of like their backstory of us being kids mm -hmm. and how they decided to take this blood oath as the Three Musketeers, right? Um, which is written by Alexander Dumas back in 1844. Um, but they were, I guess they were fascinated in this, you know, this whole group of being together and having a brotherhood because they're all, I believe, uh, 
they're all believe they were all like you know just the only child i think for the most part yeah um so they kind of exclusively kind of came together there in the society you know our community as well as where we're from um being in the forest and stumbling upon a Viet Cong head that got blown up and taken off somebody kind of can traumatize you if you find it with a couple friends i could kind of bring you together i think it is day um not in the best way but it is something so especially when you're the kid like um the captain who was bullied and picked on because he looked a lot different than all the other kids in vietnam um but yeah just to fast forward a bit where you were um i just figured we just throw that little point in there as well um, um yeah now we're now we're at the point where the captain is saying that he cannot go on telling the story anymore to the commander communist and he's having trouble trying to really recollect what else to tell or what to say he's already told us in the beginning of episode that a lot of this stuff is starting to get fuzzy to him so now he's really right. struggling he's like man you know I, i've been writing like 60 pages a day this is really hard for me i'm not gonna be able to do this anymore you know can you just verify this information with mon like he, he's got to be a high rank captain by now or something can you please just check with him and then we get to finally hear it what we've been thinking this whole entire time and the co commander communist says that's weird because you've been telling us about this Mon person, but I have no record of him ever existing. Exactly. And I'm like, oh God, you're screwed. I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, no. I said, no, you 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 basically got captured in prison and did this re-education for absolutely nothing right now. So I, I don't know where it's gonna leave us in the next episode. It seems, I mean, this seems like a highly dangerous situation for the captain, let's be honest. Um but before before you know we get closing out into the episode of what we get to actually see towards the end, um, he does visit the director and decides to release an alligator in his pool. Random. Random. And he says that that was his alligator, right? Like her name was like Allison or something like that. He releases her in the pool yes. while the producer's doing like a couple laps. And um Barely gets out of the nick of time, to be honest with you. Robert Downey Jr. almost lost his prophetic nose in that one right the scene. Um, and he says, like, will you try to kill me? He's like, well, you try to kill me, so I figure we're even now. So then we do the conversation of trying to get the re-edit to actually have uh, the communist dialogue actually in, or the Vietnamese dialogue, I guess you would say, because no one knows it's communist but the Vietnamese people. Um, right. That dialogue in this film because it's very important towards the efforts of the people in Viet Cong right now in Cyclone that are taking over. So he's pushing the envelope. The director basically says, it's like jazz, man. We just play. We don't know what's going to come out at the end. And he kind of just goes with that, you know, um, which I thought was kind of a weird reason not to keep the dialogue in there. I mean, I get it. You know, editing process is hard for anybody. But sure, that was just strange. He could just been like, yeah, I'll keep some of the dialogue. He was just like, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Which the captain easily accepted the answer, but it seemed like he was getting complacent at the time, you know? And I guess this kind of compromised some of the efforts that he was trying to push forward for, you know, pushing the envelope of this communist party that, that he actually is a part of. Yeah. Um, but as we start to wind down the episode, go ahead and run us through what we get to see when we have to take this car ride with the general. Bro, okay, so I've seen enough gangster movies to know that when you take a car ride and you have to deviate from where your original route is taking you, and you're like, hey, where are we going? That's usually a, a, a telltale sign that someone in mob films is about to get whacked, right? So, personally, when I was watching it, I'm over here thinking, no, no. Like, I'm thinking this is where the general gets got. That's yeah. what I thought, because the captain goes, someone's mm -hmm. following us, you know, so the captain's yeah. already paranoid as is. So the fact that he sees right. a vehicle following them and then, you know, they deviate, they drive around. It's, it's all like tense and suspenseful, almost like, again, a Hollywood noir, you know, very suspenseful. And then we make, like I like to say, the left turn at Albuquerque and going up the hills, right? General gets off the car. <laughs> Rolling up the hill, I'm like, oh, the, the, the captain's going to get it. Okay. So the captain runs up after the general, right? And if I'm if I'm missing something, le let me know. We get to the top of the ridge. 
If you've ever seen any of those old movies, like those old martial arts movies, where you go to the compound of the main villain mm -hmm. and you see the grunts, the new recruits <laughs> practicing in the compound, you know, their basic maneuvers. Like if this was like G.I. Joe and you're walking into Cobra, right? Yeah, yeah, you're seeing yeah. the Cobra people just like mm -hmm. practice their martial arts, practice their fighting stances. And who do we see leading the fighting stances, bro? Our man Bond. Because remember, he woke up out of his malaise this season when he found out he was about yeah. to throw hands. Because remember in the flashbacks yep. between Mon and the captain, <coughs> excuse me, who was the one that was doing all the scrapping? Yeah. Bond. 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 So oh. Bond is over here in my, in my realm. He has another job now with the general, which is like, I guess, first trainer, first cadet or what cadet trainer or what have you. But I, I was shocked because I thought it was going to go one way. And that's what I said at the beginning of this, of this review. I thought this episode was going to go one way. And then it wound up making a complete turn and the money that was used from the settlement when he was getting, when the captain was going to give it to Dumpling's wife and Dumpling's wife says, give it to the general. I think we see the fruits of the labor yeah. of the money. So we're going to war. <laughs> we're preparing for war again. Yeah. They, they, they definitely put that cash to use. I mean, my God, you should have, it's longer the process because they immediately took that cash and funded um, these war efforts. Right. Um, with uh, Cobra Kai. I was like, man, man what's going on here? They're just <laughs> karate kicks out the wazoo. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you're like walking into um, the Jaden Smith karate kid and he's like in the dojo. It's <laughs> old. Like, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh oh, I'm about to get beat up. Like, <laughs> <laughs> is wild. Um, but I think it was a pretty good episode, to be honest with you. Maybe one of maybe like my top three. Would you would you rate this episode if you had to in the top five? I don't know. I mean, if I'm gonna rate it out of five, I'm gonna say it was a three and a half. It was slightly above mm -hmm. average because yeah. now it 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 brought me back. Because remember our yeah. last review, we kind of felt it was a little bit lackadaisical. It was lacking yeah. a little punch yeah. for the duration of the episode. So similar to when we watched Tokyo Vice, and if you haven't seen Tokyo Vice, go back on the channel and watch our review of that show. It brings you back in like the mafia. It brings you back in. And this episode brought yep. us back in. And like you said, this is only episode five, bro. Like, yeah. how many more twists and turns are we going to do here? So three and a half. Yeah. Yeah. I would... I would. I'm nice, so I'm gonna give it a four. I thought it was a pretty good okay. episode. I think they had a little bit of everything, a little bit of explosion, a little bit of mystery, a little bit of uh, you know, three musketeers coming through. So, you know what? I was I was like, you know what, they, this was a good for a full circle uh episode to bring us back after the last episode that we thought, like you said, was kind of mediocre, you know. Um yeah, it was all lowest rated episode. After this. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, because it was just it just was not what we thought it was going to be, to be honest with no. you, at the end of the day. And this one, I think, it definitely piqued my interest to honestly see the next two episodes that are coming out. Um, yeah. Um, do you miss anything you didn't want to uh, touch on as well? Right. Before we go, I do want to say this. You know, we, you and I typically, we like to say what we're looking forward to, specifically what may or may not happen, or how we used to say who's going to get Paulina. I yeah. want to know who's getting got because now we're at the point now we thought the general was going to get got. We thought Bond was going to get got. We don't even know if Mon exists because the whole blood brother thing when they were standing by me as children, you know, <laughs> was Mon killed at some point and the captain just still has him in his head like he exists no. oh my gosh. because we know Bond's real. Bond's real, at least from what we see, Bond's real. Right. But Who's to say right. now that while he's at this camp, the person interrogating him or re-indoctrinating him is, is going to be like, dude, you made this whole thing up. Now, that, right. and again, you know, this is based on a novel and you and I are trying to avoid the novel at all costs. But if it turns out that this man <laughs> right. has, has Kaiser Soze this whole thing 
and made it up from start to finish because of some sort of PTSD, I'm gonna throw my hands up because because I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. feel like it wasted our time. Yeah, same. I, I honestly don't know. Equivalent that of it was all a dream. That's the equivalent right. for me. Like, oh, he just made this all up. Like, no. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, that would be so. No, no, that would be so disappointing for me, honestly, because I'm I'm so invested in the story of the captain of how lively this whole situation and scenario was for him, and right. this experience, how hard, um, for it to be all a figment of his imagination of you know trauma and PTSD would be like heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, this is so sad, man. This is so sad. Um, but which could be an excellent plot twist for a lot of people out there, honestly, that are watching this show. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, guys, let us know what you think about this episode in the comments below. Um, make sure you check out The Sympathizer, episode five, titled All for One, premiering on May 12th at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and streaming on Max right after. Um, um, like I said, yeah, let us know in the comments what you thought below. Uh, make sure you check out more content that we have just like this at BigGoldBeltMedia.com. And until next time, peace. Peace.